Hello and good afternoon, everyone. I'm Imran Siddiqui, your host and moderator for today's talk. Thank you for taking time out and join us today as we talk about the proposed Wildlife Protection Act Amendment 2021-22. We will uh, we'll leave you with uh, a better, better understanding, hopefully, of Wildlife Protection Act and also some new ideas about how will you comment on Wildlife Protection Act. So uh, we, uh, just to remember, the last date is 12th. Day after tomorrow, it's uh, put up on Rajya Sabha website, committee website. So please, uh, I would request uh, Ms. Shama to introduce uh, Sanjay sir. Thank you, Imran. It is my honor and privilege to introduce Mr. Sanjay Upadhyay. Mr. Upadhyay is a founder and managing partner of Enviro Legal Defense Firm and is a practicing advocate in the Supreme Court of India and National Green Tribunal. He also established the charitable arm of the law firm through Environmental Law and Development Foundation. He has been practicing environment and development law since 1993 and is also an India visiting fellow at the Bolt Hall School of Law, University of California, and a global fellow in marine policy at Duke University, North Carolina. He started his professional career at WWF India. Uh, Mr. Upadhyay has served as an environmental and development law pr practitioner to most well-known international, multilateral, national, and institutions, including World Bank, Asian Development Bank, USAID, UNDP, to name a few. He has been part of the drafting committees of several environmental laws in India and abroad, which include Wildlife Protection Act, the Forest Rights Act, the Nagaland Biodiversity Rules, the Medicinal Plants Policies of Arunachal Pradesh and Uttarakhand, and more recently, the Indian Forest Act. Sir, we welcome you to this session and look forward to learning more from you. Thank you. Thank you, Shama. Uh, I never knew that I'll be introduced so formally by Shama. Um, who's been my very proud colleague uh, for several years. And um, it's a real honor uh, and a privilege for me to uh, be part of this uh, conversation. Uh, thank you, Vidya, uh, for this opportunity. Uh, I'm sure uh, uh, this conversation uh, will uh, hopefully clear some of the doubts or my own little involvement with the Wildlife Act uh, uh, I'll be able to share some things uh, from the inside as well, and hopefully it'll be a fruitful session. So thank you so much for this opportunity, uh, and thank you everyone for joining in. Uh, I must tell you that uh, uh, this particular law that I see today, I've called it glass half full uh, for a particular reason, because this whole uh, amendment process itself started uh, around 2011. It's been almost a decade since uh, the government has been tinkering with it. And even today, I would say it's uh, largely cosmetic and uh, but some substantive. So it's somewhere between cosmetic and substantive that I read the current uh, Wildlife Protection Amendment Bill of 2021. And uh, uh, the good thing about being a lawyer is we can speak our mind. Uh, especially outside courtrooms and not fear about being judged. So I'm going to speak my mind today uh, and hopefully with some understanding on the specificities of what's been there and uh, how I, I look at it and maybe it will be of some help. Uh, so let's get let's jump into it straight away. I think the first thing that I really wanted to speak about is this seemingly preambular shift from protection to conservation and management. If you look at the, the new amendment, they talk about uh, a shift from protection to conservation and management. In simple terms, if you see, you, you, you know, protection is something which is more immediate uh, and conservation and management are terms which are more long term. Now, having said that in the preambular emphasis uh, of this amendment bill, uh, does it flow through the entire legislative changes that have been suggested? is something that we need to ponder upon. Uh, my sense is that while the preambular emphasis certainly is about shift from protection merely to conservation and management, it doesn't really flow through the narrative that we read uh, subsequently. And uh, I was just seeing my old notes of 2000, 
13, uh, is it getting shifted? Uh, uh, can you see the next slide? No? Um, no. You should start the slideshow maybe. Okay. Uh, F5. One second. Sorry. Uh, can you see it now? Not the slide, slide only we are seeing. First slide. Okay, let me just see. Uh, sorry for this. Uh, can you see this next slide now? No, sir. Can you still, just do F5? Sanjay, the, still the first no, slide is selected, so you have to start the slideshow. In... It should be in okay. the presentation mode. Yeah. Can you see the second one now? No, no sir. Uh, no. Sorry. Just, uh, just F5. It's not F5. moving. Uh, and you yeah, can see no. it. it's it's fine now, sir. Yeah. Okay. Uh. So. Okay. So. Uh. Yeah. So let me just uh, move on. So as I was saying that, if you look at the entire legislative changes that have been drafted today, that shift from protection to conservation and management doesn't seem to reflect as clearly. So that's the first. Uh, important point of concern. And uh, as I was saying that when I looked at my earlier notes of 2013, when the, the earlier draft was sent to all the states, I find a lot of things picked up from there and weaved uh, in not a very, very coherent manner. And therefore, my comments will also be not very, uh, because it doesn't flow. Uh, there isn't uh, uh, a thought behind it in that sense. And therefore, uh, I will like to comment on few points and see how it goes uh, for the rest of you. So another thing that is coming is habitat, for example. Now, habitat earlier was only for wild animals. Now it is also for specified plants, which is a good thing, really. But the third thing which has been discussed a lot, I also see the narrative and the literature around, uh, that the concept of invasive alien species have been introduced. Now, if you look at, at the face of it, it's a very important provision because invasive species uh, has been a cause of concern, not just from the land, but also from the sea. And we've seen things like uh, ballast water. I mean, uh, ships which comes from different jurisdictions and different habitats when they come in and they offload the ballast water, a lot of marine species get impacted. Uh, and of course, through the land as well. So what is what is the thought behind a introducing it of course there's an enabling provision which says that it will regulate it will prohibit the import it will prohibit the trade possession proliferation etc uh, but how that is the question you know because if you see uh, invasive alien species the manner in which because today it is just said that there'll be a notification that will come and that we have to perhaps wait for that notification of how they really want to deal with the invasive alien species but I think it's an important point and it's an important uh, uh, component that has been introduced. And we need to understand the implications of how only when we get that notification. And, and, and uh, so I, I look at it as only as an enabling provision at the moment. Then the fourth objective, obviously, is to streamline the schedules. I mean, the schedules, as we all know, right from 1972 onwards, has been you know, evolving, changing, uh, moving from one schedule to the other. When you, for example, when you talk about a uh, scheduled animal, uh, to, a, to a lay person, a scheduled animal would mean any animal or wild animal which is in a schedule. But if you look at scheduled animal in the Wildlife Act context, it is only Schedule 1 and Part 2 of Schedule 2, which has been prohibited for trade and commerce under Chapter 5A. So, you know, without being very technical, the point I'm trying to make is that schedules have been fairly complicated. And therefore, it's, it's a welcome sign that streamlining of schedule should happen. And of course, now the whole CITES appendix has also come in, uh, forming the part of the schedule. So I think it's important that streamlining uh, should happen. And that's what has been done. Now, what happens in a law is when you change certain definitions, it has huge implications. So for example, if you look at the definition of person, uh, person was only a person or a firm in the earlier draft, in, in the earlier law. And now we have person which has been expanded to include company, authority, 
association of or body of individuals, whether incorporated or not. So what happens is you're, you're broad basing this whole concept of person, uh, which of course is there in law already, but you have not looked at in the Wildlife Act before. Now it has been looked at. And therefore, when you look at the licensing re regime, for example, it will be expanded to that larger definition of person. When you're talking about captive animals and surrender of captive animals, you'll find that it again gets expanded by the definition of person. For transfer of wild animal, for international trade, for breeding of live specimens, for uh, the definition of manufacturer, for hunting, destruction, all these scopes are now expanded to a larger definition of person. Now, at the face of it, it looks absolutely fine and legal. But when you link it up with breeding of live specimens, when you link it up with international trade, we are actually talking about a corporate entry into this arena. I don't know whether that's good or bad, but this is something that we need to ponder upon because wildlife conservation has been quite conservative in this country. So when you're talking about including companies and authorities and association of bodies and, and, and individuals uh, for things like international trade or breeding of live specimens, etc., then I think we are getting into a, a very interesting uh, domain, if you like. Now, another change that has come in, uh, this is quite uh, ironical. They, they finally define what is a schedule and they, they also introduce a provision to, to change the schedule. But in the draft, they've already changed the schedule. So I didn't understand that because if you now want to introduce the power to amend the schedule, how could you amend the schedule already if you don't have that power? But these are, again, legalese I don't want to bore you with. What's important is that now the declaration of vermin has, not, has been expanded. And it is not restricted to one schedule, you know, schedule five, etc. So now there is a huge array of species that can be declared as vermin. Now, at the face of it, if you look at it, this this change, uh, uh, you know, addresses a man-animal conflict in many ways. But it also gives a lot of discretion, and that discretion is largely to the central government and not to the state government, as many of you might know that this power of declaring a vermin was earlier with the state government. And then it got shifted to, uh, to the central government. And now the, the scope has been enlarged in terms of what would be a vermin. Now, of course, it is contextual. But what are the parameters? I think this is where we fail a lot while we have the umbrella framework. But when it comes to detailing, we fall short of it. So how would you declare a vermin? Why would... Uh, why would you know a rhesus macaque be a vermin in uh, uh, you know in Shimla versus a wild boar in X place or or a Schedule Four uh, Neil guy in 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 my village where it is a problem? So what is the discretion or what is the what are the parameters of declaring vermin? I think that needs to be expanded more rather than just the power to declare vermin because I think the the power is one thing but the manner in which you do it is another. So I think that's another important point that I wanted to share. Uh, very interestingly, the concept of zoo now includes ex situ conservation. Now the face of it, again, it looks extremely positive and we need to understand uh, uh, the how. You know, zoo includes ex situ conservation, but how is again missing? Because we all know that the way Indian zoos are managed, there are some good ones, some bad ones. But what's important is that if now you want to use the zoo space for ex situ conservation, that's a pretty sophisticated scientific exercise. And whether our zoos are ready, whether our central zoo authority is equipped, whether our capacity, human capacity is there to promote ex situ conservation in the manner in which it is understood in science, again, all these things need to be teased out and merely changing the definition of zoo uh, may not help completely. Uh, then, of course, the National Board of Wildlife has been given the power to constitute, uh, you know, these subcommittees and expert groups 
uh, and they call it on certain terms and conditions which will be prescribed later. Um, okay, so, so what is important now is to look at uh, this whole power of National Board of Wildlife, uh, you know, where they say that subcommittees can be formed, expert groups can be formed with a certain uh, terms and conditions which should be prescribed. Now, we don't know what these terms and conditions would be on, on what basis these committees will be formed. So I think these kind of clarity is, is required uh, whenever we make a change of this nature. Uh, now, if you look at uh, now, the one of the biggest uh, conversation that I see uh, is on, on this whole standing committee of the state board. Now, we all know that there's a standing committee of the state uh, national board that has been created and it's been uh, talked about and uh, people have been quite critical about it uh, as to why only two people from non-government sector uh, and uh, why they should have so much of say in decisions. I think there's a fair, uh, uh, that's a fair comment to make that when you shift the decision making process to only a few, always there'll be either a bias or there'll be a, a you know, a discretion always has a, has a problem associated with it. Now, what we want to do with this amendment is we want to shift that discretion to a much smaller group at the state level. Now, I have been party to several of these State Board of Wildlife meetings. Uh, and what I see that the presence of the chief minister brings at least some kind of, uh, you know, seriousness or, or the, the uh, uh, you know, the stature to a wildlife clearance. And there are there are there are a lot of conversations around, uh, you know, when when the chief minister is attending a meeting, uh, so it becomes quite a, a serious affair in that sense. But what we are now planning to do is we are planning that out of the 31 members, uh, you know, which included the chief minister at the state level, now apart from the minister in charge, not more than 10 members can form a standing committee. Uh, and what is important is that even the quorum is decided by the board. Now, what is that quorum? What is the basis of that quorum? I mean, we all understand there is something called quorum in our constitutional sanctity, but here that is not defined. So what is the quorum, whether it will be two persons out of those 10 or four persons or five persons. So the whole 31 member team that was supposed to be there from different representation now gets reduced to less than 10, if you like, to clear projects. Now, obviously, this is diluted and this will dilute the rigor of any wildlife clearance at the state level. And what is more important is, as I said earlier also, that when you look at a wildlife clearance procedure, for example, you need to be more specific on the nature of a particular project. Now, today what happens is like a one size fits all. There are two expert members, some official members, the minister will be there a project will go. Now, with all respect to independent members who are also you know, known to us in some ways, and they've been part of this uh, conservation circle for a long time. But despite the fact, unless you have the specific expertise of that particular infrastructure or that particular project or activity, I don't think you're going to take a good decision. And that is what is happening to a number of wildlife clearances because there is no direction on co-opting, you know, specific members who are necessary for that kind of an infrastructure. So I think this is something that we need to really understand when we are delegating this whole, uh, 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 you know, National Board of Wildlife or State Board of Wildlife to, to the standing committee. I mean, at the state level, I'm still very, very, uh, uh, you know, skeptical about this shift because it really takes out the, the rigor that was there earlier, if at all. And I think it's going to become worse with this particular shift. Uh, very importantly, the powers are supposed to be delegated to such standing committee. Now, I must tell you that even as we speak, this formal delegation of power from the National Board of Wildlife has not happened, even for the National Board of Wildlife Standing Committee. I don't know how many of you recall uh, way back in 2014, when the NBWR itself was constituted wrongly, we had to move the Supreme Court to get it corrected. 
and only when the national board of wildlife was reconstituted it was expected that they will delegate not just the power but also the duty to the standing committee of the wildlife unfortunately even that has not happened and one of the reason is because after the reconstitution of the national board of wildlife even the national board of wildlife has not met and for that also we have moved the supreme court uh, in 2020 notices have been issued but i think it's a very important point that needs to be understood that national board headed by the honorable prime minister is the highest board and the supreme court on 5th of october 2015 has trusted the national board of wildlife and moved the clearance procedure from the supreme court to the national board of wildlife so if that kind of trust has been reinstated in the national board of wildlife it is the national board of wildlife which needs to act in accordance with law unfortunately nbwl till date after being reconstituted has not delegated that power and the duty to the standing committee they have not even met so it's and and please understand that national board of wildlife is not just a body for wildlife clearances national board of wildlife is a body it is the highest body of the country where even the supreme court has reposed its faith again by saying that it will guide the policies of wildlife conservation you know how many people know what is the national wildlife action plan today what is the conservation strategy today where are these plans being made how it is being made who is vetting what kind of project should come in and i think wildlife uh, the role of nbwl or the national board of wildlife is far more than just clearing projects in and around protected areas i think that shift has to be understood that role has to be understood unfortunately i still maintain that it is not acting in accordance with law and that is why the supreme court has issued a notice i hope the national board of wildlife gets a, a little more alert on on this aspect and do what it's supposed to do in accordance with the wildlife act then of course uh, the the land acquisition act has been uh, uh, correctly transposed the new land acquisition act then obviously the compensation regime etc will be in accordance with the new law which obviously is the law and therefore those these are these are minor cosmetic changes that have come in which are which are very 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 important um uh, photography has been expanded to include film making uh with a caution that destroying of habitat should not happen uh but a very interesting shift has happened which i don't know how many of you have noted if you look at section 29 of the wildlife act for those who are not familiar section 29 essentially says that if you want to do anything in a sanctuary you know if you want to destroy any wildlife or you want to remove any wildlife you want to get any water inflow if you want to change a bit of a habitat then it has to be a in the interest of wildlife and number 2 you have to get the permission of the board now board in in the earlier draft or in the current law was only the state board because if you look at the definition of board it is state board but now that shift has happened that if you want to do anything in a sanctuary although in practice i think it is still the national board but now that legally has been changed and from state board it has been shifted to uh, the national board now i think this is an important shift which needs to be to be understood so now if you look at this whole destruction in a sanctuary there have been certain exceptions in the past also so for example if you want to take grazing or livestock in a sanctuary it was allowed uh, but now if you are doing hunting under section 11 which is basically for for any uh directed hunting you know of a diseased animal etc by by the permission of the chief wildlife warden then it is allowed but what is important is that the permit regime which is under section 12 of the wildlife act even now they have introduced what is called as hunting even for section 12 which was actually never there so this is a little shift that i see in section 12 uh because there is a detailed permissive regime a permission regime under section 12 Uh, and therefore if you allow all of that it is outside the purview of this destruction framework 
that currently exists. So that is something that needs to be understood. Uh, I don't know whether this is this is a, if there is a catch in this, but I think the permit regime under Section 12 now largely is exempted from the rigor of Section 29, where as you saw earlier, it the permission has to be given now by the National Board of Wildlife. Uh, then of course the rights which are already allowed in a sanctuary, you know, and this is the reality of this country where rights rights can continue in a sanctuary. Uh, now, of course, with the Forest Rights Act, it can continue in national parks as well. Uh, those are also exempted uh, from the rigor of Section 29. And then, of course, they've introduced uh, the bona fide use of drinking water and household water uh, by lo local communities. Now, the assumption obviously is that there are people living within and around the sanctuary uh, with valid rights. And therefore, that bona fide use has been exempted uh, uh, you know, all that, all you have to ensure, of course, is is whether these bona fide use uh, is determined as bona fide and not as a measure of something else uh, in the name of bona fide use for drinking water. Because what I am seeing now in many projects is that huge, huge irrigation projects are suddenly changing uh, overnight into drinking water programs just because it does not have the rigor of environmental law. And having fought several cases in Telangana, etc., my, my understanding is that the state government starts with this whole holier than thou drinking project, and actually it is under the garb of huge irrigation projects. Not, I'm not saying it is a wrong thing to have irrigation projects. What I'm saying is that the rigor of environmental law is different for, for irrigation projects. The rigor of environmental law compliance is rather uh, easy for drinking water projects. So we need to not just uh, you know, divert the issue, but certainly meet the law, if at all, uh, it requires the environmental compliance that it currently has. Uh, moving on, if you see a very interesting change now, uh, I, I, I don't know how many of you remember that the Supreme Court made the working plan a legal document as early as December 12, 1996 with the Godavarman case. And it was said that every state and every forest compartment will have a working plan which will be approved by the central government and that becomes the guiding planning document for working of the forest. Now after uh, 1972 for the first time the management plan has become a legal document. And for those of you who are familiar uh, there are three kinds of plans. One is the working plan for regular forests. Then you have the management plan for protected forests, uh, for protected areas. And then you have the micro plans for uh, joint forest management kind of initiatives. Uh, now, what is important is that uh, while the management plan being given a legal sanctity obviously is a positive thing, uh, but it has to be approved by the Chief Wildlife Warden. So there's an assumption that uh, Mr. Chief Wildlife Warden or Ms. Chief Wildlife Warden are the most appropriate people to approve it. Of course, in law they are. Uh, but what is important is that it has to be in accordance with the guidelines issued by the central government. Now, I don't know how many of us are familiar with the guidelines that have been issued by the central government and whether it's in public domain of how to really make a management plan. I know that the working plan code is out there but the management plan, I don't think it's there for public consumption as such. And I think this will be a, a interesting move to see what kind of guidelines are framed based on which the chief wildlife warden and his or her office will approve the management plan. My difficulty with this whole thing is only one, that there are other management plan or planning documents statutorily recognized in the same space. So if you look at, for example, the conservation and management plan under the Forest Rights Act, which can also overlap with the sanctuary, which can also overlap with the national park, how do you reconcile the two? I think there is nothing in the law which really talks about it. Merely a consultation may not help, and I'll just come to that very, very quickly. If you look at, for example, the People's Biodiversity Registers that are made under the Biodiversity Act, again, it's a planning tool. So somewhere you have to link all the planning tools for the same ecological space because it flows from different statutes. 
it has different legal consequences. So if we are making the management plan as a legal document, you have to be conscious about the other planning tools in the same ecological space. I think that has been missed, unfortunately, and it needs to be really put in there so that people understand the statutory planning process in India. Uh, then again, uh, very interestingly, and this is something that I often get a bit angry upon, uh, is, is how do you look at scheduled areas in this country? In scheduled areas, if you see, uh, uh, one, of course, there's a recognition of scheduled areas in the Forest Rights Act. There's also a scheduled area recognition under the provisions of Panchayat Extension to Scheduled Areas Act. So if you look at scheduled areas, this particular law does not make a very, it does not make a very important distinction. And that important distinction is, how do you look at scheduled areas in the fifth scheduled states versus how do you look at scheduled areas in the northeastern states? Now, if you know the northeastern context, you will appreciate that four out of the eight states have scheduled areas. And those six scheduled areas is constitutionally recognized, and so is the fifth, but the regime of management is very different. And I think unless you understand the regime of six schedule in a northeastern context, just by saying scheduled areas uh, in FRA is not going to be enough. Because what it does in the current law or the current amendment is it talks about consultation. It talks about uh, now, does consultation means consent? Because this is the big challenge. You, what is consultation at the end of the day? Are you giving the right information? Is the consultation process defined? Because as I said earlier, autonomous hill councils are very different animal. Regular fifth schedule areas are different animal. Now we need to understand that these institutions are very, very different. And therefore, they are they recognize these areas also differently so the role of ministry of tribal affairs the role of panchayati raj the role of uh, department of northeastern region they all need to come in when these kind of processes are being put in place unfortunately i don't see that in the current law because in my view the conservation and management plan which is now part of rule 4 of the forest rights act will come in complete contradiction with the management plan if they don't align and reconcile with each other. So I think somewhere we need to have this clarity that there are other statutory plans and we need to reconcile with the management plan if it has to become really effective. Otherwise, it will be a breeding ground for conflict again. Then, of course, uh, there are some, uh, again, cosmetic, uh, if you like, but government lodges uh, are also now allowed under section 33 in controlling of sanctuaries. I don't know whether the government is now trying to compete with, with uh, the private players, but now even they are uh, allowed in section, uh, under section 33 uh, as a proviso. Uh, interesting provision has been added for renewal of arms license. We all know that registration of arms license is a requirement and was a requirement. But after the registration, Nothing was happening because people didn't know whether people had those arms, where are those arms, whether it has been renewed or not. So now this provision, in my view, is a fairly good provision because it talks about giving intimation to the chief wildlife warden if we have to renew our arms license within a boundary of 10 kilometers. So I think it's an important provision which needs to be uh, appreciated. Then... Another shift that has happened, and I think it's again a welcome shift, although never implemented, I must add, is the recognition of Section 18A in the context of National Park. Now, for those who are not initiated, 18A is nothing but simply put, these are those provisions that while you are settling the rights of the people in a national park or a sanctuary, in that transition phase, you are supposed to give benefits or you are supposed to ensure that the livelihoods of the people living within that area is not affected. So their firewood, their livelihood, their, their resources are not encroached upon, not immediately closed just because there's an intention to declare a particular protected area. Now, this was not there for National Park. So I think this is a good correction where these alternatives now have been made 
part of the National Park too. And I think it's important because even as we speak, a good number of national parks and sanctuaries, this process of settlement of rights is still not complete. So I think it's important that this provision has been added. But as I said earlier, that this 18A, which is giving that provision to communities, neither people are aware nor they are getting it on the ground. And I think it's an important point uh, that needs to be flagged. Then, of course, there's a tweaking of the community reserve. Uh, many of you might know that in 2002-2003, two new categories of protected areas were added. So it's the conservation reserve on one hand, where it can be constituted on government lands, normally for connecting to protected areas or buffers to a protected area. And then the concept of community reserve, which could be made on private land as well as community land. Now, what is important is this never took off. And I think it's important, even today with the tweaking of the law uh, as it is con currently proposed, I don't think it's going to take off. And one of the central reason is that community reserve, which is my land, my community land or my private land, just by making me a member of a community reserve management committee is not going to instill a confidence of community reserve management in this country. Because if you tell me that my community reserve, which is my private land, is going to be managed like a sanctuary, the biggest fear I will have is tomorrow the state will take it away, which is happening, which is happening in many states. For example, uh, I don't know if you're familiar with the Kerala Ecologically Fragile Lands Act. If you just even look like a forest in a plantation, it can be divest, you can be divested of the same without any compensation. Again, that's the fight that is going on in the Supreme Court. But what is important is that this kind of tweaking is not going to, and there, there are enough evidences to this, it's not going to make the community reserve concept a live concept. Because from 2003 to 2022, it's been quite a while and we can still see that not many community reserves have been notified. And it's time for the government to understand why. And as I said earlier, one of the reasons why it has not come up is because of the fact that we have equated it with a sanctuary, that it will be managed like a sanctuary. So obviously that's not going to help. Now the law says, the amended law proposes that private landowners should also be part of the committee. Is that going to help? I'm afraid not. Because uh, as long as sanctuary provisions are applicable, people are not going to have that confidence. Another thing that is being uh, observed is the panchayat control is being increased. Now, I'm, I've always been of the view that panchayat, whether we like it or not, is a political entity. I'm not saying every political entity is wrong or right. But what is important is in these kind of community management the role of the Gram Sabha is more important rather than the Gram Panchayat. So unless you weave in the role of the Gram Sabha in making these community reserves more active, we are still going to have a problem. So I think that is something that I wanted to flag as well. Uh, now another shift has happened that conservation reserves can now be declared by the central government. Uh, now at, at one level, you know, it is it seems okay because even sanctuaries and national parks can be can be declared by the central government. I don't know if you know it, but I certainly don't know which was the last natural, national park or a sanctuary that was declared by the central government, except in union territories, of course. Now, if you take that power for a participative concept like conservation reserve, then I think there is a bit of a centralization effort here. And I think it needs to be understood that a conservation reserve was added in 2002-03 for a participative conservation model and not for a centralized conservation model. So I think that shift may not work very well is my understanding. And that's the point I wanted to flag as well. Another little twist, I think it's very important that if you look at the Wildlife Crime Control Bureau, and I've had the fortune of being one of the advisory board members when it was created in 2006, and what I found was that for the first time, the role of the police was very important. And there was an IG police, I still remember her as a very dynamic officer, 
as heading the Wildlife Crime Control Bureau. But there, I could also sense this contestation between the police and the forest department in a forest, forest government setup. So in the ministry, when you have a police officer manning or heading uh, uh, the Wildlife Crime Control Bureau, the forest bureaucracy did have a problem. And I'm not surprised that the police post is now removed and it's only the IFS officers who will come and man the or head the Wildlife Crime Control Bureau. I think this is this is uh, this is uh, something which uh, which dilutes it because getting a fresh police mind in crimes of wildlife, I think they are far more equipped than us. Uh, when I say us, I mean the Forest Department. Uh, they are far more remo uh, far more equipped. Uh, you know, their training is much more superior when it comes to crimes. And if you only train them on wildlife, their training of crime and wildlife certainly would, would, be, would be more useful uh, in, in Wildlife Crime Control Bureau. But I think the shift has happened for reasons best known to the government. Uh, then there's another tension that we see, those who are practicing this field will know more, that there is this unwritten contestation between National Tiger Conservation Authority and the state government. You know, no state government likes this supervision, uh, which comes from by way of an authority. I remember when in 2006, when the NTCA was, was drafted into the law, there was a lot of contestation between NTCA and the state governments. Even the person heading NTCA at that time and his own state head, uh, you know, from his own cadre, they used to have quite a bit of a contestation. And I think this is important because NTCA has this overarching power to interfere in state tiger reserves. And therefore, I think this is perhaps uh, something to douse the fire, if you like. They have now said that the provisions of NTCA is in addition to and not in derogation of the existing powers on sanctuary and national power exercised by the state. So it's an, I think perhaps it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a manner to, to douse that fire between NTCA and state government, because otherwise NTCA was of the view and certainly the law said so that they would override the state government in matters of tiger reserves. I think that has been perhaps looked into by this definition change. Uh, then of course, disposal of government property has been allowed, of course, uh, uh, not for auction or commercial sale. And again, the guidelines will be coming from, from the central government. Hopefully it will come soon. Only then we'll know how disposal of government property is supposed to happen. Another provision has been added, uh, which says that you can surrender a certificate of ownership. And uh, uh, that was uh, not allowed earlier. Now it has been allowed. I think this is all, these are, these are again, important provisions because these, uh, uh, you know, if you surrender these certificate of ownership, uh, of course, there's a, another challenge that even today, as we speak, several wildlife products do not have a certificate of ownership. And I think that could have been addressed also, but unfortunately it hasn't. Uh, sale of live elephants has been, uh, at least seemingly it has been allowed, but if I, if I read the law carefully and earlier attempt of changing the law, it is largely the transfer of live elephants that have been allowed, especially with people who have domestic elephants and so on. I think that has been allowed, but I think the role is still not clear. This needs a bit of a uh, handholding here. But I think perhaps the most important provision that has been added uh, again after 1976, when we signed the Convention of International Trade in Endangered Species of Fauna and Flora. And finally, this chapter has come in uh, by, way of the, uh, by way of drafting it into the Wildlife Act. Now, on one hand, this is a celebration of sorts because after 1976, international trade was spoken about. Uh, and, and, and then we had signed it. It was ratified, but somehow the International Tra Trade in Endangered Species, uh, which formed part of the appendices of the CITES, never got connected. So this is for the first time it's been talked about. Uh, by the same time, I want to red flag it also, because we now are talking about artificial propagation. We are no now talking about uh, uh, captivity breeding. We are now talking about international trade. We are talking about uh, uh, breeding. Uh, we are talking about, uh, you know, uh, basically we're talking about wildlife trade. And of course, institutions have been set, which is already there 
but now it has assumed a legal color. But I would look at this whole chapter uh, with with a lot of seriousness and also with a lot of caution uh, because this is something new to us. It has to be seen uh, how it sort of unfolds in the coming years. Then, of course, there are again some some very cosmetic changes of penalty, which has been increased, uh, you know, to one lakh instead of twenty five thousand. The compounding fee has been increased, uh, but very importantly, the Wildlife Crime Control Bureau and the Management Authority under CITES they have now been also given the position of an authorized complainant. I think this is a very important move because till till this point in time. The Wildlife Crime Control Bureau, despite the fact that it came in 2006, has, was never authorized to file a complaint in a court of law. And as we all know that most of us don't go to the court, especially the trial court, when we see a wildlife crime. So I think this is an important and a very significant move to make the Wildlife Crime Control Bureau an authorized complainant. Uh, then, of course, there is a whole provision of regulating and prohibiting the import of, as I said earlier, invasive alien species. Again, that notification is, is awaited as to how it will be done. And a very interesting provision like the Environment Protection Act, you'll see that the central government, and this is kind of a trend, I would say, is now assuming the power to issue directions. Now, the moment you have that power to issue directions on wildlife, on one hand, it sounds pretty good because the central government is in the know of things, but this is also looked at as an encroachment on the on the on the state power and this whole federal and state sort of con conflict and contestation does happen. So I think this is an important provision. Yet we have to see how it unfolds uh, uh, in the uh, you know in the coming years. Uh, so that was about uh, you know the 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 bill itself. Uh, but I must tell you in a couple of slides, and I'll I'll shut up after that, and maybe hear some questions. Is there were larger issues that were discussed in the last ten years? Unfortunately, that has not found way, and I think they are very central to wildlife conservation. One example is how do you link evidence to specialized agencies? How do you see the role of the Wildlife Institute of India or the like institutions? How do you link it with the Central Forensic Sciences Laboratory? How do you link it to the State Forensic Sciences Laboratory? I think these are very, very important things on prosecution of wildlife crimes. And I think this is completely missing by the current draft. The whole classification of offenses, for example, they have to align with the Criminal Procedure Code. It does not at the moment. It needs to be looked at. Maritime zones have been missed. We only talk about territorial waters, but areas beyond national jurisdiction, again, is an important habitat and people have been talking about it, but somehow this has been missed uh, in the current draft. The way and the manner in which you declare sanctuaries, even today, or a national park or a tiger reserve, I think it's time that you have concurrence of the local community. I think it's time to have the concurrence of the Gram Sabha, especially after laws like FRA and PESA. I know it's a tall order, but I think it's important. Not a word on elephant reserve, not a word on biosphere reserve, not a word on elephant corridors. I think these are real issues, again, which has been completely missed because these are management concepts. And I'm afraid unless you make these management concepts a legal reality, we are just going to have these programs and we are just going to lose a precious wildlife if we don't come back with a lot of rigor. Another important issue is what happens in the interim when you are settling a right? You will be surprised to know that we are sitting in 2022, but rights have not been settled even from 1973 onwards. What happens to those areas? There is a bar of accrual of new rights under Section 20 of the Wildlife Act. What happens is in that interim period, of course, now there is a, there is a timeline of two years for settlement of rights. But despite that timeline, despite two Supreme Court orders, rights have not been settled. Now, what happens to private lands within these areas? Today, you can't sell it because there's a bar of accrual of new rights. So I think these are practical issues that needs to be looked at and the wildlife amendment must be looking at and should be looking at these things. There is no clarity on deemed sanctuaries, for example. There is no, not a word on regulating angling, for example. It's a, it's a huge thing in, in a lot of countries, including India. 
But a lot of angling associations are quite disappointed that there's nothing in this new law. The parameters of ecotourism or nature-based tourism, again, yeah, I think it needs a legal cover. That's completely missing. There is no clarity on boundary demarcation. The biggest problem in this country on conservation is the lack of reconciliation between forest and revenue records when it comes to boundaries. I think these are important things which needs to be touched by the law, which it hasn't. Alteration of boundaries. You'll be surprised that the Forest Rights Act is considered to be a tribal law, but that's the only law in this country which says that the critical wildlife habitat, if at all it will ever be created, will never be diverted for any other use. But that is not so for the critical tiger habitat. So in my understanding, once you have looked at a critical tiger habitat, or once you have assured and ensured that there is a critical wildlife habitat, please follow the FRA and say that it will not be diverted for any other use, for God's sake. But I think there is nothing on that in the new law. The NTCA and the National Board of Wildlife I think it's time to have constitutional bodies like the National Commission on Scheduled Tribes, which it doesn't. I think it's important. The whole process of wildlife clearance. Again, there is no clarity. Today also, everything is guided by court orders. Not that it's a bad thing, but I think it's time for the bureaucracy to understand and lay down what will be the process of wildlife clearance. Please come back with a set of rules so that people know on what basis are you clearing or rejecting a particular clearance. The role of CEC uh, is well known. Uh, again, uh, I always say much to be desired. I know that my friends are watching me here, but I still would say that there is lack of clarity in terms of how do you engage in the process of wildlife clearances. Again, role of third party in prosecution. You'll find that there is absolutely no role of third party in wildlife cases who may have a lot of expertise and understanding, but there's no provision there is no enabling provision in the new law. Then the need for a comprehensive database on wildlife crimes. I think this has to be a statutory requirement today because if it is not a statutory requirement, it is just not done. And I have so many examples of so many states where these kind of comprehensive database just does not exist. And wildlife crime, as you know, is next to narcotics. And therefore, it's a very, very organized crime. Unless we really get into that kind of a database. I know Wildlife Crime Control Bureau is doing something, but you need to make it a legal requirement. Only then it is ensured. So I think I'll end with, with saying that we probably need more debates. It's not just about drafting something and introducing in the Lok Sabha and then be reacting and giving these little comments. I think meaningful debates must happen. Meaningful discussions may happen. Why should we, why, uh, why should we only react to a particular draft? I think uh, we must be cautioned that this is an era of amendments. The Wildlife Act is changing. The Biodiversity Act is changing. The Forest Conservation Act is changing. The Finance Bill for people who manage or have oversight in these acts, they are changing. The EPA is changing. The Air Act is changing. Is there a design? I don't know. I'll leave, leave it to you. Or it's a routine to show change for better or worse. I think the silent stakeholder will speak loud and clear in the coming years. Thank you so much for this opportunity and I'm ready to take some questions. Thank you, Sanjay ji. It was fabulous and uh, really, uh, uh, really, really nice presentation. It's, it's, it's covered a lot of ground, which generally people don't talk about. But uh, to start with questions, uh, we ask people to just uh, put questions in the chat box for now because we don't want, again, uh, problems from the people. Uh, so we are, yeah, so questions can be asked to the host. So before they start writing the questions, because we have uh, blocked the thing, uh, I would like to ask whether the current uh, um, the parliamentary committee is going to look at provisions which are not listed there. Like, for example, you are talking about uh, uh, research in uh, not there or NGO's role is not there or settlement process is not there. So can we propose these things? Will the committee have power to look into other than what is uh, already put on uh, the notice board? Certainly, why not? Uh, the whole purpose of putting it in the joint parliamentary committee or group of ministers, which is a parliamentary procedure, uh, is that, uh, that you hear, because if you look at the clause-wise comments that have been placed before the committee, uh, they obviously are guided by that, 
because the rationale of these changes are given there. But this is an occasion if if there are good suggestions, uh, they 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 can certainly look into it, and and amend it. That's the whole purpose. While people uh, will be typing the questions, I would like to ask another question uh, about uh, tiger uh, tiger reserves themselves. Um, do you think uh, tiger reserve is not uh, described under the protected areas? Only sanctuary national park is described. So what happens when you have uh, the sanctuary part and also the buffer part? So the buffer part is it a PA or not? There is no clarity on that. There is no definition of tiger reserve. So be clear that tiger reserve is not legally a protected area. Tiger reserve constitutes within its critical tiger habitat or core area the protected area network. So if you look at part of the uh, tiger reserve, which is the core area, those are normally and essentially national parks and sanctuaries. And the area surrounding that, again, which is supposed to be made with the consultation of the people, etc., that forms the buffer. So together, the tiger reserve needs to be looked at. And if you remember, right in 1973, the whole concept of natal and dispersal area in science, that was started and now it assumed legal color in 2006. So it is the core which is protected areas essentially and buffer which is around it, which is the whole concept of ecologically sensitive zone, for example, under the Environment Protection Act. So that is how today it is envisaged. But the buffer is not technically a protected area because they, are, they can be any land, they can be private land, community land, or any other uh, uh, you know, land which can form the buffer between two, two tiger reserves. Yeah. If it is a reserve forest, uh, which is in the buffer areas? It can be. So that's a reserve forest. That's it. Okay. So here the questions have started coming in. Sir, there is, a, uh, there is conservation of endangered wildlife animals, but nothing for trees. So I have that. So, so Wildlife Act, as you know, uh, is, is quite uh, restrictive or I would say uh, not very happily worded as far as uh, specified plants are concerned. I mean, that is certainly now in the law and that whole list of specified plant has been expanded. But if you look at the definition of wildlife, it includes the plant life. So it's not as if wildlife is not covering plants. Uh, but when it comes to specificity, then it is only limited to specified plants, which is now expanded in the new definition and the new proposed amendments. There is one trivial question whether uh, public can make comments. Yeah, also, I think it's obvious. Sure. Yeah, uh, Samrita, Samrita Shankar, uh, can you ask a question? Hi, uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Yes, yeah. we can. Uh, uh, good afternoon, sir. Um, uh, I wanted to ask a question related to marine conservation. You had mentioned that, you know, uh, this amendment does not uh, uh, address uh, many aspects related to marine biodiversity, especially the fact that it only extends up to the territorial waters and, and not beyond that. Uh, and we also know that it's, it's a, you know, considered as a terrestrially oriented law. So are there any more amendments that you would have, uh, are there any amendments that you would have liked to see in this that uh, could have benefited, you know, marine conservation, for instance, like uh, giving a definition to marine protected areas, a specific guideline, including uh, a wider range of stakeholders in, in a management committee, something to that extent. Uh, yeah. So, uh, Samrita, today what has happened is uh, we are, as you rightly said, we are quite territorial in our approach to wildlife conservation. And that, therefore, it's only extending to territorial waters where we have our control, where state control is there. But if you look at areas beyond territorial waters, then all you need to do perhaps is tweak the word territorial waters to maritime zones. The moment you say maritime zones, Territorial waters, contiguous zone, uh, completely comes into the picture. And we are talking, but the, and, and there are now concepts of areas beyond national jurisdiction as well. And, and uh, uh, where, you know, countries can come in together, uh, you know, 
Sri Lanka and India can come in together and protect uh, areas of importance, marine importance. So I think we need to look a little more, uh, you know, not territorially, but more from that side, because, you know, I mean, the fact that three fourth of our planet is still water and oceans, we still don't think enough about marine conservation. So, uh, yeah, it's all about tweaking the word a little and getting that into the, your jurisdiction and looking outward the way uh, I've just mentioned, and it's possible. So, connected question to this, uh, do you think uh, there should be separate uh, laws like uh, anything in Sanctuary National Park is like with Section 29 and 36, it becomes very difficult. Marine is a different thing with a uh, lot of fishermen dependency and all that. Do you think there should be a separate thing for marine? No, not not necessary. You know, always getting a center new law is always very difficult. If you can if you can tweak the existing law, it's possible to bring out that specificity. It's not very difficult because if you see section 18 today or section 35, which creates protected areas, the concept of you know the consultation with the chief naval hydrographer and the concept of territorial waters is already there. All you need is to to extend that into the maritime zones. And talk about ABNJs. If we talk about area beyond national jurisdictions of marine importance, uh, you know, we have gone inside the Kaklamar and what kind of, you know, uh, uh, international conventions, the conservation of marine living resources. And despite that, we don't draft that into our law. Now, for the, uh, as I said, after 1976, this is the first time we are drafting CITES into the Wildlife Act. Uh, so I think it's going to be uh, a while where the Migratory Species Convention and the, uh, you know, Kakla Mar kind of conventions uh, will be drafted back into the law, which is constitutionally possible because you look at uh, Article 253 of our constitution, it says that wherever we go and commit internationally, we must ensure that they are actually meaningful in a national context. So it is possible. It can be done. It all requires state will and that vision uh, for, for the larger wildlife conservation space. Ganesh, can you ask your question? Yes, sir. Uh, good evening, sir. Happy to hear and uh, talk to you directly. Uh, this yes. is regarding tree growers' uh, issue. Uh, tree growers are restricted in the name of conservation or scheduled tree or endangered species. But uh, I, to my understanding with from RTA and many uh, organizations, there is no list of endangered tree species in India. It is not aligned with IUCN or sites. And... Uh, there is no guidelines or management plan to conserve or recover endangered species. In such a situation, restricting the farmers is unfair. How can we uh, change this? How can, what we can do it? That's what. Uh, I know, I know, Mr. Ganesan, you've been at this for, for quite a few years and I, I, I read your post. Uh, I, think, uh, I think it's important you know, this issue is very important. And if you look at the current regime, you'll find that trees outside forest areas is a big thing uh, that they are envisaging. And I'm given to understand that there is also a law in the anvil, which is going to address precisely the issue that you're talking about. How do you encourage farmers to grow such species, which are also finding itself in, you know, in the protected area category or in the list of, uh, let's say, specified plants or in state laws, for example, from, from where you come, uh, you know, those kind of things. So I think uh, you need a different framework because the general understanding is that if you allow a species which are also found in the wild, there's a possibility of exploitation. And I think that understanding is quite rhetoric. It's quite stereotype. I think we need to move beyond that and develop a very sound framework of trees outside forest areas to start with where farmers can be encouraged. But unfortunately, our agroforestry policy, which is the mandate of the Ministry of Agriculture, the Ministry of Environment and Forest, Ministry of Rural Development and Panchayati Raj, they don't really sit together on this very crucial issue that you've raised. I think it's time to do that and have a different framework so that trees are an incentive for the people and not a disincentive for the people, as you rightly said. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Sunil, uh, you want to ask? You can unmute yourself, Sunil. 
Well, uh, he has put a question: Can the critical tiger habitat be uh, converted into critical wildlife habitat under FRA? Can uh, because uh, there's not much coming up from critical wildlife habitat probably. No, so so you have to understand that they flow from different laws. You can't interchangeably use a critical wildlife habitat concept under FRA and transpose it to the Wildlife Act. Critical tiger habitat is a separate regime, uh, which unfortunately can be altered, etc. It has a different, uh, uh, you know, uh, context. Of course, tiger is also wildlife, uh, you know, uh, and, a, and a very uh, glamorous species of this country. But uh, critical tiger habitat and critical wildlife habitat cannot be interchangeably used for one another simple reason that legally they are still different concepts. And today, while you can alter a critical, uh, uh, you know, while you can alter a, a tiger reserve, which is included, uh, which includes critical tiger habitat within it, but you cannot alter a critical wildlife habitat under the FRA. So I don't think it can be used interchangeably. Another question is, uh, is ecocide, which late Polly Hingins and Baltada worked on, is going to be adopted in India? Ecocide Sorry, come is, again? Will ecocide, ecocide is, I think it's about punishing people who have destructed environment, I mean, bureaucrats and all that. Will, uh, which uh, late Polly Hingins and Baltada has uh, worked on, going to be adopted by Indian government in any future time? I, I certainly don't see uh, in the near future. I think I think the, the framework that we have in my understanding, uh, humble understanding, it's, it's fairly strong. I think it's the machinery which needs to understand it's the capacity of the people regulating these areas and people who are fighting it at the court level. I think there's a lot of work required at the capacity building uh, space. And unless we do that, you know, it can be orientation of lawyers, it can be orientation of judges, it can be orientation of scientists who go and depose before uh, such courts or not depose because of difficulties. Very simple things like what kind of facility are we giving to our forest guards who actually apprehend the criminal? Today, there is no support to that person. You know, because if you look at the Wildlife Act, it is not possible or at least it is not, uh, you know, envisaged that witnesses will be available in those remote areas. And therefore, the law says that even the evidence that is given by the conserv assistant conservator of forest, that is also admissible in a court of law. But even those evidences don't come in. There are no evictions. Uh, there are no convictions, rather. Uh, and I think it's time to build those capacities at the ground level uh, based, as I said earlier, you know, where is the linkage of wildlife science versus the, uh, the, the, the Central uh, Forensic Sciences Laboratory or the State Forensic Lab, uh, Sciences Laboratory because evidences are crucial in trial courts. Unless you have strong evidence, unless it is presented strongly, you don't get conviction. And we see the fate of so many wildlife cases never reaching the Supreme Court because of this. To lay down the law. Sunil, you had anything more to ask? Okay. Uh, another question is like uh, uh, the schedule one species like uh, whale shark when it is caught by mistake by misidentification by the uh, fishers and they bring it to the uh, Mangalore port or whatever uh, the landing sites. So what uh, are they culpable? Are they, this is a crime which they are doing. Like how is it under the so WTA? So see, I, I think everything is based on the evidence uh, that you that you create. I mean, uh, you know, people who are familiar with the terrain, I'm sure they distinguish between what is a whale shark versus what is another kind of fish or another kind of marine uh, species. So uh, while there could be accidents, there could be, uh, you know, uh, misunderstanding of species, etc. Uh, and, and there are many examples of that. Uh, but a lot of it is by design also. But if you just rule out that possibility and, 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 and assume that everybody is innocent, unfortunately, in environmental law, the burden is always on the accused. So it is for you to tell the regulator of why and how it is an accident and it's a, a case of mistaken identity. And you have to describe those circumstances based on which. And one of the things that when you come and confess and when you hand over, by finding a species, I think that itself 
would be a strong enough ground for you to be uh, relieved rather than you be prosecuted. But I think you have to create those evidences. That's important. Are you going to ask? Yeah, thanks, Imran. Uh, good evening, Mr. Upadhyay. Uh, that was a brilliant presentation, very crisp given the short timelines. I have a bit of a expansive or a bit of a, let's say, imaginative question. Now, you introduced this law and, you, and it's still in a draft stage and you said the, it takes the tone and approach of a conservation and management rather than a protection what it was earlier. Okay, given this, do you think it would make sense if one of the suggestions could include use the law as an instrument towards achieving the climate change targets, especially you know, through forest carbon credits and related and the conservation of biodiversity and related issues. Do you think that would be a useful suggestion into the act? Um, if you ask me theoretically, yes. And the reason I use the word theoretically is because still that connect between how do you look at your protected area regime and then link it up with sustainable development goals or link it up with, let's say, uh, carbon finance uh, is still a long way off. You know, we are still not at a stage where we can grow trees outside forest areas and get into carbon finance. So we are still quite far from that concept. You know, we've been debating the red plus regime and compensated conservation regime for a while, but we haven't got a penny because of that. And then we are very boastful that we don't need the money. But at the same time, we do need the money. And I think unless we really uh, uh, get that conversation and agreed upon uh, internationally and get those funds getting moved uh, to such protected areas, because, uh, you know, we are, we are very fortunate that we have close to 4.1% uh, as our protected areas. And it is, uh, you know, and, and there's, a, there's an effort to increase that. So if in a country like ours, we have 5% of areas as protected areas, certainly it's a great case for compensated conservation and get the climate finance benefits if it can. But it's a long cry, but there's no harm in putting it in the, in the suggestion, I would say. Sure. Thank last you very much. Question. One last question, Sanjay ji. Uh, why the critical wildlife habitats, uh, how, how many of them have been declared? If not, None. Why? None to my knowledge. <laughs> Why do you think so? Like, why? Uh, where is the problem in this? The I think the problem is is, is central to the law itself because it says very um, humbly and very innocently that you cannot change it for any other use if you declare it. So, so the the Forest Rights Act says that if the tribal cannot have the right in the area which they have protected over the centuries then it cannot be diverted for any other use. And that is now drafted in the law. Because when we were drafting this law, one of the things that we had in mind was that some areas in this country and, and people who know protected area regime will tell you that while we have 4.3% or whatever as a geographical area, even today, not even 1% is really, really core forest uh, you know, in this country. So they say that if you can declare at least 1% of your landmass as critical, which is essential for your own life, what is the harm? But I think we are still far away from that and we are still not sure uh, because we still want uh, our, uh, uh, you know, the choicest area maybe to be diverted for other uses. So I think we still don't have that courage to tell the country that we are going to save it for posterity. I mean, look at Bhutan. He, they have gone and put it in their constitution that they'll have more than three-fourths of their forest throughout their life. I mean, that's a country, you know, which we can learn from. But I don't think we can't even commit 1% of our land for posterity, unfortunately. Sanjay, sir, I think we are running out of time now. There are a couple of more questions. Do you want to take it or like, okay. So there is this Swapnil uh, is asking, uh, is there any regulation or guiding principles for interlinking of rivers? Because there is so much uh, mis, uh, uh, there's so much views about how uh, dangerous it could be for ecology. I think it has to be answered in science because uh, if interlinking of rivers are those areas which are passing through protected areas, then it has to have the rigor of the wildlife clearance procedure. And as I said earlier, 
that we still don't have that rigor? Where is the science really backing it up? Or is it economics which is driving it? I think that's the larger question to be answered. So I think th this will be the last question. Um, will giving legal status like uh, wetlands or forests help in destruction, uh, help in saving the destruction that business lobbies are doing? Will, um, I don't know, like, do you think uh, that, I think this is pertaining to wetlands, uh, the new wetland rules and all that. Do you think that no, is I, useful? I, I, see, uh, I mean, although I'm a lawyer and every lawyer will vouch for giving legal, legal color to everything, but you know, legal cover to any ecological space is only the first step. Unless people, uh, you know, uh, are aware of it, unless the government is sincere about it, and unless people have alternatives to it, you know, all these are important. Because you just by creating a law and secluding a space is not going to help in conservation. You have to address the question of economics. You have to address the question of livelihoods. You have to address the question of infrastructure. And unless you balance it out, and I know it's a far cry, uh, just by giving a legal protection, just by giving a legal nomenclature may not really help conservation, but certainly is a great step. It's a great reminder that certain areas we want to protect and certain areas we want to conserve and manage now. And I think it's important to put that legal color uh, so that people have strength that if there's something is going wrong, at least you can take those people to court or, or go through the legal process of protecting those areas. Thank you, Sanjay, sir. It looks like we have run out of time now. So I'll, I guess we'll just finish here. I think we have covered a lot of ground and uh, it's very difficult. I mean, you have uh, given so much uh, insights into so many things. So we would, uh, we have recorded this presentation and uh, we should have told in the beginning itself, we are recording it, but uh, the message is there up. Uh, we will be putting this on YouTube. It's fine, sir. So for, so that we can actually share it and use it again, because uh, it was a short notice. We still, we got around 120 participants at a time. And I think it was a wonderful presentation. And uh, Vidya, you want to add something? No, I just want to thank uh, Sanjayji for giving his time. Thank you so much for a very informative presentation. Yeah, thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, all of you. Uh, thank you, Vidya. Thank you, Shama. Uh, thank you, Imran, for this opportunity. And uh, I hope to uh, uh, you know, connect with all of you again. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. Thank, thank you, sir. Thank you, sir.